Good morning, everyone, again. Round two. How's everybody this morning? Good to see you out, and what an amazing weekend. Big shout out to Clearbrook. Come on, would you give it up for our Clearbrook campus today? So good to have you with us, and uh, we're so glad to be together this Memorial Day weekend. I just want to say a few uh, things about that, that uh, we are reminded today because of our freedom of men and women who gave their lives for us. And I pray that we would forever be grateful for that. Maybe they represent a family member of yours that gave their life uh, for us so that we could have freedom. Let's not forget that this weekend, okay? And be forever grateful for their lives uh, that were given so that you and I could be here today. Are you thankful for that? Say yes. yes. Me too, me too. You know, it really is a weekend about giving. People that have given their lives. Um, for us. And uh, I want to say thank you for your generosity today in giving to the Lord. You know, isn't it amazing when we come and we talk about giving today, because that's what I want to talk about in, in our giving of our whole life, and specifically talk about the giving of our tangible tithe and offering today. And I want to just encourage you to know that every time you're giving to the Lord, it's an act of worship. It goes together. How many of you know that? You can't separate those out. And um, it's so hardwired in us because God is a generous God. Isn't that true? He has been so generous to us. And so he's called us to be generous back and to other people. And so it is an act of worship where we come and express our hearts. And I don't know, maybe, have you ever wondered what you should do during the offering? You ever wondered what that is, what you should do? I mean, what should happen? What's the moment supposed to look like? I just want to talk a little bit about that. Kristen and I were on staff at a church before we came here that their services got started after two hours. You ever been to one of them? Well, that was that church. And I had the privilege of preaching there a couple of times. We were on staff. And, you know, if I hit a bad pitch in the sermon, someone would be like, help him, Jesus. How many of you are with me? Help him, Lord. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I get like 20 minutes into preaching, and I thought it was time to quit, and all they would do is just encourage me to keep preaching. I don't know if you've ever been in a service like that, and uh, they just, uh, they couldn't even imagine somebody stopping preaching, you know, after 30 minutes. They just want it, and they just keep encouraging it to come out of you, and so you can't help it but preach. And so, but the best part of the service was actually the offering. It really was. If I look back and I see that, there was a constant expression of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. There was a constant overflow. There was constant feedback and connection and joy because it came from a sense of gratitude in their hearts. You know, and I watched moments over the years that we were there and served there of people holding up their offering envelope and just waving it to the Lord like, thank you, God, with a heart of gratitude or or people that would come and bring their offering and just lay it on the altar because they just felt like, hey, God, this is expression of my worship to you, and I'm going to give this back to you. And it was amazing as I stood there and all. People would sometimes dance down the aisle because they were so excited to give to the Lord. Could you imagine that? There was this amazing attitude of worship. So here's the dynamic. The offering, instead of being a moment when they were kind of, you know, like on autopilot or bored or thinking about something else, was actually a time of defiant joy in their life and in their heart. Defiant joy against saying, oh, wow, well, this world got the best of me, or I owe this, or whatever it may be, or the enemy has tried this, but that's not true. I am going to give Because God gave his best to me, and I'm going to help someone out. I am going to be a giver and not a taker. And it was a powerful electric moment, for sure. And and, and so they were offering themselves to God out of the very worship of their heart. So today, I want to talk to you about being right on the money. Being right on the money. How many of you know that money talks, doesn't it? You might be like the person who said money talks, but all mine ever says is goodbye. How about you on that? So I want to point out some scripture verses from Corinthians today, 
If you go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he says this, 8 verse 7. But since you excel in everything, get these words, since you excel in everything, well, what is he talking about? In faith and in speech and in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. This is such incredible language here. Since you excel at everything. Can somebody say excel? Excel. Yes, excel. And if you know anything about this letter that Paul wrote to this church in Corinth, it was a place where people were really into how gifted they were. That they would be boastful and competitive about it. I thought about what an apt expression for us in Virginia, not too far from D.C., where we get all pumped up about what we know and what we do and how much we achieve while the pressure to excel around here. Really, isn't that true? So the words come to us, since you excel in all these things, he's saying, you excel in all these things, see that you excel in the grace of giving. There are a couple words that describe giving, but the one that he points out here is this word excel. That is a real stretching word, isn't it? Because if you look at excel, you excel at it. You just, you don't just do it, pay attention to it, study it, practice it, practice it. How many of you know you can't be good at something if you don't practice it? Hello, church? You can't be good at something if you don't practice it. That is so true. So how are we to excel in life if we're not practicing what God's told us to practice, right? So aim at it, generosity, excel. Where do we get, we come excellence, excel. Be excellent in giving. Be brilliant, that's the word. Be brilliant in giving to the Lord. Be brilliant at it. We want to be brilliant at so many other things, but God says, I want you to be brilliant at your giving to me. God rewards generosity. If you believe that, say yes. A study has shown that generosity fights against isolation, depression, discouragement, living longer, and living better, and you are more fulfilled if you live a generous life. It's powerful. He doesn't say excel in your obligation to give or excel in your duty to give or excel because there is pressure to give. No, he says excel in the grace of giving. Don't be a gritted teeth giver. You ever seen people that are gritted? You know, their teeth are gritted and they're not happy about giving. Don't do it with clenched fists. Don't ask how much do I have to, but dance your way to it. And excel your way into it. I'm going to need your help this morning. Can I hear an amen? Okay. Because whenever time, every time somebody talks about giving, people go quiet and people, oh, all they're looking for is money. That's old language. You need to get that out because we're talking about God's word today that tells us to excel in the grace of giving. That's God's word, not mine. I'm just the messenger today. Okay. We have to dance our way to it. So I'm going to give you five things today. How we as a church can excel in the grace of giving. Here are a few observations. Are you ready? Are you ready? Number one, people who excel in the grace of giving learn to live gratefully within the means of God's provision for their lives. Let me say that again. People who excel in the grace of giving learn to live gratefully within the means of God's provision for their lives. Now, we saw this from Paul in Philippians 4, 12 and 13. He says, I've learned a secret. How many of you want to learn a secret today? How many of you want to know that? I've learned a secret of being content. Well, what's the secret? I've learned the secret, he said, of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul actually instructs people about how they ought to set aside money. I'm going to step on some toes because there's American mindset going on in the room. I'm going to step on some toes today, but that's okay because I'm bringing out God's word. Because people only think their savings is for the end of their life, 
and I'm going to hoard it, and I'm going to keep it away. But that's not true. When you look at Scripture 100%, yes, we should save for our future. I'm not going to be uh, naive or stupid on that. But what he actually says is that you should save so that you're able to give. So there actually ought to be margin between what resources have come my way and what I actually spend in my lifestyle, right? So the key is where there is margin plus contentment equals financial peace. Are you with me? That's what people are dying for in the world we live in and what people in this room want. At the root of debt is wanting more than God's provision for my life. Wanting more than what has come my way And so what I'm going to do is find an alternative way of forcing it into being. That's what debt does, and that's where debt comes in. At the root of debt, very often, it is us saying, hey, God, I think that you messed up on the provision level for my life. You don't see me. I I think it needs to be way up here, God, way, way up here. What would make me happy? More lifestyle, more possessions, more affluence. So I'm going to find a way, God, of doing that. God, I think you got your wires crossed on me on this one. I don't trust the level of provision coming into my life that you're sending me really is the right one. So I'm going to go into debt to create a new provision in my life. Now, isn't that true? See, USA Today had an article about this. Credit card companies send out $4 billion solicitations every year, that's the equivalent of 16 letters to every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. If you breathe, you got one of these. Matter of fact, your dog might even got one, right? So it's amazing. You hear from your credit card companies more than you hear from some of your relatives. Wow, isn't that true, right? It's a primary reason that keeps people from excelling at the grace of giving. Debt makes people live with a constant sense of financial pressure, and I will tell you what that is. It is bondage. It is bondage. Proverbs 22, 7 tells us this. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower borrower is what? Slave to the lender. That's God's word. That's wisdom literature, that that is what he's saying, that the borrower is slave to the lender. It's a form of slavery. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from people who get in over their heads financially, and what comes next is shame. P.T. Barnum said, money is a terrible master, but an excellent servant if you make it work for you. So true. There's so much uh, pressure of finances in the day we live and in this area that we are in, housing, the cost of living, incomes not seeming to keep up in this area with the cost of living. And what I want you to know today is there's no shame and guilt in what I'm preaching about because at the cross, Jesus came to take the shame and the guilt upon himself. But let me tell you something, when it comes with a definitive decision to break the bondage of debt, that when you do that, you will find newfound freedom more than you ever have in your life. Like, I am done with debt, and I'm not going to allow this to be a bondage in my life one more moment. I'm going to take steps to do that. So if you want to excel in the grace of giving, you're going to have to do that. Number two, people who excel in the grace of giving view their present resources from an eternal perspective. How many of you know the present world we live in is going fast? Really, it is. It's going fast. Your life and my life are going very fast. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in where? Heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy where thieves do not break in and steal. What he's saying? He's saying that is the place where it's not vulnerable to corruption and decay, and it's going to last. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? If I invest in other areas, my heart is there. Temporary stuff is moth 
food. Right? People who excel in giving understand there are two good categories when it comes to treasure, temporary and eternal. Most of the things that we get our heart wrapped around are temporary, aren't they? Like our homes and our cars and the things we own and the things we go purchase, our heart many times get wrapped around those things. And so what is in the eternal category? It's God, just God, and the people whom God loves. That's eternal. And are we investing a great deal more of our life and of our time into God and into the people that God loves more than anything else? Because those are the only two things that are absolutely eternal. Right? Dallas Willard said this, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. That is so true. So what I'm saying today for crying out loud, would you start investing in what is eternal? Are you with me? Would you start investing in the things that really matter? Really matter? And that will show up on your account when you and I go into heaven and we walk into heaven and we know that we have laid up treasures for eternity. It's time for the church, it's time for the body of Christ to focus on what is eternal and not temporary. Amen? See, because we have wrong understandings, we have wrong spending habits, we have wrong understandings of what money should do, we have wrong info about money that the Bible talks about to get us back on track. And so, you know, yearly we usually come this time of year and I start talking about giving and talk about giving because guess what I know? To be all honest, we're about ready to hit summer and a lot of you are about ready to go on summer break and you're gonna go on vacations that you deserve and that you have earned. You're gonna spend time with family. But also I know July is the lowest attended month for churches in America So you're going to go spend time with your family and vacations, and many times what happens is the church takes a hit on their giving. I'm just being honest. Can I be honest? I'm not done. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to hide it because most of you know that, and that people walk away, and then the church, we still have giving. We still have outreaches, and we still have things that God has called us to do, and so I want to encourage you today to know this, and I just kind of want to give you a little snapshot. For those of you that were in our annual vision meeting, you heard some of these, and uh, they were a part of our, our financial report. Last year was an amazing year at Abundant Life Church in reference to many things, but in the area of giving, of tithe and offering. That $1.8 million came in for tithe and offering in 2018. Can we give the Lord a hand clap for that? Amen. That is awesome. Yes, Lord. We've been able to see that increase. Our our support of missionaries was $126,000. Last year, our benevolence was 19,000. You heard me say a few weeks ago that even from last year to this year, we've been able to increase our missions by 10%, which is absolutely amazing. And so we paid on the mortgage $137,000 last year to pay down this debt that we want to be out of. And this year so far, we've already paid $78,000 dollars on debt reduction to this church. Amen. That is awesome. Thank you, Lord. That's because there are generous people here that are giving. You, that you have come and said, hey, I'm going to do this. And and one of the things that uh, is wonderful that as our board guides and directs this church and does such a diligent job of doing that is as you heard, that we, we have a yearly external audit that takes place with a firm in Winchester and uh, that they look over our books and we are in good standing there to know that your money is held financially accountable and we are being stewards of what God has called us to steward well. Amen? Because why? It's eternal. Number three, people who excel in the grace of giving choose their financial goals carefully carefully. So have, have any of your children thrown a temper tantrum when they didn't want to share something? Yeah. Yes. I remember the first time one of my kids did that. I thought, where did this come from? Where did this come? Who passed this mutant gene onto my child? 
right? I, I tried to think which of Kristen's relatives did they get this from? <laughs> and then I could only look to myself and said, well, that's me, right? So here's the interesting thing about kids. No kid ever had to be taught the word mine. You ever notice that? No two-year-old ever looked at their parent and said, now, what's this concept of personal ownership again? How, how do I grab? Right? How do I take? No, no. That's inside. We have to learn yours. We have to learn ours. In God's word, we learn that, and we learn generosity. Here's what I found. People who excel in the grace of giving, and so many of you do, and it's amazing to hear the stories. There are amazing stories in this church of people who are excelling in the grace of giving, people who excel. And what happens is people that are excelling get really clear and really intentional about giving. That, that they're not going to allow fuzzy to get in the way of what their goals are and where they are headed in their finances. Um, many people, though, are in a fog. How much did you give last year? I don't know. How much do you want to give this year? I, I don't know. How much will you save? I have no idea. How much will you spend? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's fuzzy. But people who excel in the grace of giving give because they've decided to give. They've decided to give in their heart what they will give what should the spirit in the room be when we bring God 10% of our income and our offerings? What should that moment look like? Well, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. He says, each of you should give what you have what? Wait, wait a minute. Each of you should give what you what? Decided. That's a decision. How many of your decisions are definitive decisions? They are a decision definitively. That's not foggy. That's not fuzzy. That is Okay, I will decide in my heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves what kind of giver? Cheerful. God loves a happy, hilarious, joyful giver. And when people have that understanding, they are freed up from worry, and they are filled up with God's love, and they trust God, and they live with joy, and they laugh and say, I am one of the strong ones, I'm one of the givers, and I'm not going to be one of the takers any longer. Maybe today you said, you know, I couldn't give John because uh, I don't have joy, and I didn't have joy when the offering plate passed by, the, ba the bag or the bucket. Well, Maybe you've been here for years and you've never given. You say, I can't give with joy. If you've been here that long, I would tell you, fake it after that long. Just fake it, okay? Just fake it, okay? Sometimes the joy comes first. Sometimes the giving comes first, and then the joy follows. Amen? We got to get right on the money. We got to get right on the money because you know why? It tells everything about your heart. Everything about your heart. With over 2,000 scripture verses in the Bible about giving, God doesn't shirk it. God, God doesn't move it down the road. God deals with giving foremost on the front burner and says, hey, this has everything to do with you in your heart. So Chuck Feeney started the Duty Free Shops. If you've traveled through any airport, you've been those larger airports, they have Duty Free. You know what I'm talking about? Duty Free, you go in, you don't have to pay customs on it. He made a fortune. He was listed a few decades ago by Forbes magazine as one of the 20 richest guys in the world. It turns out Forbes was mistaken, and they wrote another article about this, and his fortune was actually larger than he had thought. But then when they wrote at that time, he had already secretly, because he didn't want attention, given his fortune away irrevocably to a foundation that was devoted to philanthropy. The foundation now has given over $6 billion away. It has about $1.6 billion more to go, and it will be the largest foundation ever to give itself out of existence when that happens in a couple of years. The more recent Forbes article about him was called The Billionaire Who's Trying to Go Broke. Billions and billions of dollars. He estimates today he's worth altogether about $2 million now. He wears a $15 watch and uses a plastic bag for a briefcase. He says this is his ultimate goal. I want the last check I write to bounce. Wow. 
Some of you are thinking, hey, I'm bouncing checks right now, and I'm not even dead yet. <laughs> People who excel in the grace of giving get really clear. That's what I'm saying. What a fabulous way to live. They get really clear on how they're going to give, what their goals are. And then they do their spending and their saving habits around that. So I'm going to encourage you today to get out of fuzzy. There's no life in fuzzy. There's great materials out there. We teach yearly in financial peace here. It's a wonderful, wonderful course. For those of you that have been through it, Chris and I have been through it as well. Um, how to Master Your Money by Ron Blue. If some of you want an in-depth book on how to go in, and really, it really deals with the heart of giving and saving investments and things like that. That's a great book as well, How to Master Your Money by Ron Blue. That one's been out there. Over 800,000 copies sold of that book. But that's why we're talking about getting right on the money. Then when you give, you celebrate it. Do you celebrate it? Four, people who excel in the grace of giving associate generosity with joy. It actually makes them happy when they give. And so 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2, Paul says, We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. It's in the midst of a very severe trial. Now, they had a severe trial. It wasn't little. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Studies have proven that generous people have more joy than those that are not generous. Number five, people who excel in the grace of giving have settled the ownership issue. I want to talk about that as my last point. Ownership is about stewardship. See, I think your whole life is unsettled and foggy and turbulent if you've never signed over the deed of your life to Jesus. And stewardship means down deep someone that is entrusted with another's wealth or property and charged with the responsibility of managing it in the owner's best interest. So you and I are stewards of everything that God has given to us. He's entrusted it to our care. And how many of you know that stewardship is not an elective? Are you with me? Stewardship is not an elective. It's not an elective in God's word. It's not something you can opt out of. It's not like that. Stewardship is when you, you, you start to mature in Jesus as a follower of Christ things begin to fall into place. So there is not maturity without stewardship. Those two go hand in hand. It's too big, it's too pivotal of an issue, and God is saying, if you've given your life to me, he's like, hey, I'm gonna talk to you about this area, and because I'm a God of abundance, and I'm a God of overflow, then money has to be a part of the conversation and the trust factor in our lives. Know this, that God owns everything, Right? And we are the managers. We're the money managers. We're the talent managers. We're the time managers. He owns everything. We're simply the managers. And you can search through the Bible. God says, you're in charge. It's yours. God has given it to us. You start in Genesis and you go right on through and you see this, Adam and Eve, hey, I'm entrusting you with everything in this garden to do and to steward it and to have dominion. And what happens is they messed it up. In a few scriptures, Psalm 24, 1, if we ever wonder if God owns it, it's the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and the world who live in it, it's God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, many of you are like, ah, well, I don't know who owns my body. Well, you're not your own, you're bought at a price. Everything that we have has been entrusted to us, and he wants you and I to get it to the proper destination. New York Times, April 21st, 2018, wrote an article about a mail carrier who stashed 17,000 pieces of undelivered mail for more than a decade because he was overwhelmed by the amount he had to deliver. <laughs> the carrier, Alexei Gurmish, told investigators he made sure to deliver the important mail according to a complaint filed in federal court. How would he know what's important or not? But I deliver the important ones, you know what I'm saying? I deliver that one. Yeah, right. Okay. But 17,000 pieces of mail were found in his keeping that he never delivered. It was charged with as a federal crime. I want you to know this, that you and I are the delivery mechanism 
for all of God's blessings upon our lives. And if any of you are hoarding it, you're in sin because trying to outsmart God is sin. I love you, but I'm going to tell you that. You and I are the delivery mechanisms for our gifts rather than keeping them inside and not serving ministries. You and I are the delivery mechanisms for our giving. If you're just hoarding it, you're keeping it for yourself. That is against God's word, against your time that you give to the Lord. That is against God and his word. That is sin. You and I are just the mail carriers to get it from one place to another. That's it. We're not called to hoard it. I don't know about you, but about the time that I hoarded something, God found a way to get it out of my bank account anyways. Are you with me? Now I'm spitting truth, right? Yeah. Let's give it to him on the front and let's give our first and give our best. And so when God talks about stewardship, it's not about that little bag or the bucket that we have, but when we talk about stewardship, and I brought this up last year and I'm gonna bring it back up as a visual. When we came to Christ, we said this, we're all in. The bucket means we're all in in Christ. We're all in. Everything we have, our time, our talent, and our treasure is inside of the bucket. Everything that we do in our lives is inside the bucket, all in. But we live in a world where we like to live a lot like this. In Christ, we just want to live like this. Well, you know, I gave my life to Jesus, but I'm going to keep this out here for now. And I'm going to, that's how I'm going. No, God says, when you came to me, you came into the all-in life. When you came to water baptism, you said, God, my life is not my own. And I went under the water to realize and to know this. I'm no longer going to live that way anymore, but I'm going to live for, G- for you, Jesus, 100% completely inside of you. I am all in. Some of you are like, well, it's my car. No, it's not. God gave you that car for a reason, to be used for his kingdom and his glory. It could be picking somebody up. It could be helping them. It could be just delivering the mail from one spot to another spot. Well, it's mine. It's mine. You don't know what I paid for. No, I don't. And all of that. Well, well, it's my house. No, it's not your house. God has given you that house to start a small group in your house to, for the glory of the Lord. Stop hoarding the Lord's stuff. <laughs> Woo, not very many claps today. I don't want to hear this stuff, do we? No. God's given your, your, your house for a purpose and a reason. It could be rescuing, hurting people. Well, well, it's my kids. Oh, God says, no, no. I've entrusted you with your kids to steward your kids while you have them upon this earth, right? So when I give the minimal, now remember, 10% is the minimal. That's the starting point. Some of you are like, that's the pinnacle. No, that's the minimal. Right? And listen, am I telling the truth? Because there's some people here, they're already judging me. They already got their flags up from the moment I started talking. But what I'm saying is the truth. The 10% is the minimal. It's not the pinnacle. It's the starting point. And then you have offering and then you have alms and on and on with the giving that the Scripture talks about. But that's the starting point. And, and so some of you today will say, um, I, I can't give 10% right now in the financial situation I'm in. I would tell you, start at five. I would tell you to start somewhere. We're not going to get legalistic on this, but to leave people to say, I'm not going to give anything and leave $10 in the bucket one time a year, uh, that is not stewarding the money that God has given to you well. That means you're investing in you. So, Well, I worked hard for it. Yes, you did. But God said, I gave you air to fill your lungs to do it. I gave you the ability to obtain wealth, right? And so when we look at stewardship, if we allow God in, we steward our whole life before him, and we're found in him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What would your life look like if you were found in Christ today? No, 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 no. Don't tell me what America has to say about it. Tell me what the scripture, if I'm a believer, I abide by the word of God before I abide by the law. Amen. Amen. This is the point Jesus is making. You ever notice how some people live 
They put their stakes down so firmly into the ground that they, I'm going to be here forever. No, you're not. I just read it this week in Job. I just read it again in Timothy. You came with nothing, you're leaving with nothing. 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 You came naked, you leave naked. Do it. These are the things we're impressing upon our children. Do this. Are you giving to the Lord? We do ask our kids that. They do live under our home. Don't be afraid to ask your kids. Hey, you're working a job. You should want to give. We should want to give because we love the Lord. Right? Not under obligation. I just want to give because, God, I love you. I love you. I love you. So I will give because that's what you've asked of me. 10%. 10%. I got so much to say about this topic, but I got to bring it down. I believe the number one blessing on this church is because of our generosity towards missions. I'm going to say it because we believe as the board that that is so true. Our, the blessings that God has given to us is because we're giving to worldwide missions because we have a world that is lost without Jesus. We believe that. So it really is settling the ownership issue. So let's do that and let's realize that, that this and what we do of our time, our talent, our treasure is eternal and moth and rust can never destroy it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Thank you that you were so generous with your son that you have called us to be generous back. I pray that we would get this. I pray that we would get clear. I pray that we would read your word. I pray, God, for those that are in this room that are under the bondage of debt, that today they would come up with a decisive plan to get out of debt and stop living in fuzzy and start living in clarity. In Jesus' name, amen.